All right. Again, thank you so much, everybody, for showing up for the, the uh, Establishing Large Forests grant uh, webinar opportunity. Um, we will be going through a number of different things. Uh, the presenters today will be myself. I'll be going over the program-based uh, portion of the, the webinar. Uh, we also have the grant administrator, Michelle Higgins. She will be going through the contract stuff. And then Brad McMillan will be doing a uh, run through of the new SFS grant management system. Uh, so we'll have all that stuff. You will have options um, to ask questions as we're going through. We'll also have a Q&A after Michelle and I finish. Uh, so we can go over program based questions uh, and then Brad will start and then we'll have a Q&A after that. So you can follow up on uh, what he's covered as well. Uh, so you will have plenty of options to ask questions. The chat is also being monitored by one of my colleagues. Uh, she will be breaking in occasionally to let us know what questions have been asked. Uh, if they are really in-depth questions, uh, we may just be reaching out to you via email so that we have uh, a way to get back to you in the most thorough uh, format possible. Uh, so you may not get a chat answer, but we will get back to you. This recording will be posted on the uh, ELF webpage. Uh, once I get it done um, with all the edits, I'll have it posted on uh, the webpage for everybody to view at a later point in time. Again, thank you for showing up for the ELF presentation. Uh, this is a grant that is being run uh, through the USDA NRCS program in a partnership with Climate Smart Communities as well as uh, New York State's Regenerate New York grant. And we'll dive into the details. Again, if you guys could please make sure that you're muted if you're on the phone, make sure you're muted, double muted so that we don't have any feedback because we are getting some. Thank you. And maybe I can ask Michelle too to go through and make sure everybody's on mute uh, as we're going through. Um, okay, so we'll dive into the details here. Um, the goal of the ELF is really to um, help reforest areas um, across the state. There was a study that identified about 1.6 million acres of idle land that was available for planting. Uh, now, there are several uh, entity of several efforts uh, vying for that acreage, whether it's solar, whether it's tree planting, whether it's development, there are lots of fingers trying to get into that pot. Um, one thing we did identify was that 90% of those lands potentially available for reforestation are privately owned. And the big crux that we hear from a lot of our private landowners is that doing what plantings uh, is both challenging to have the expertise to do it, as well as really financially burdensome. Um, so the ELF purpose is really to help provide financial support to help establish those new forest areas on private land through um, tree planting, uh, as well as associated work like site preparation, protection from deer, um, and monitoring and maintenance activities, um, all to be focused on non-industrial private lands. <clears throat> Again, we at the DEC recognize that there was a gap in the capacity, um, and that ELF is really designed to help assist private landowners um, get to that next generation of forests to help provide that crucial climate change mitigation factor, help provide wildlife habitat that's decreasing across the state, and protect vital air and wa uh, water quality, as well as all the other vital resources that we get from our forests. Um, and again, private lands being at that 90% of the, the actual total are really going to be essential for reestablishing these forests and ecosystems across uh, New York's landscape. <clears throat> Um, Ian, if I yes. could sure. ask a couple of questions that have come up already in the chat. Um, yeah, please. So related to siting, um, there's a couple of questions already about our areas where there isn't a viable forest right now because of ash death, um, maybe invasive species, Phragmites, like if there's just a few, maybe like 10 or 15 healthy trees standing per acre, um, are those areas uh, I guess, eligible for this grant program? Yeah, so I think we're getting into some that's gonna probably be more on a case by case and site specific uh, situation. Um, this grant is really not necessarily been designed for uh, restoration work. This is really for open lands. Um, and I will get further into this, so I'll just touch on it quickly right now. Um, yeah. We understand that that's a component of the forest and if I, I, we don't really want to set a basal area as a stringent kind of target to monitor. Um, but based on our conversations, we're thinking threshold wise, if, if you're seeing 
a basal area around 20 to 30, you're probably not going to qualify for this grant. Um, now, you can always reach out to us with questions, send us pictures, um, and not necessarily snapshots from a trail cam um, or something else that's not a high quality thing. We need to actually be able to see what's on the site and what uh, is going on there so we know what we're talking about. Um, so that's kind of the component there. And I'll get further into it. Should, is there a place where you say okay? Uh, again, everybody, please make sure you're muted. Thank you. Um, I think I answered. Isn't there another question there, Molly? Nope. Um, that covers okay. it for now. There's more questions coming in, but I'll wait until you kind of start covering some okay. of those. Okay. And again, um, some of the more technical ones, you maybe people maybe reached out specifically uh, to say that we'll get back to you um, via email. Just again to be, provide a more thorough uh, and in-depth response, so that we're not just uh, wasting your time. Okay, so I'm going to dip back into the overall grant um, details. This is uh, um, going to be a $4.5 million opportunity, the full grant funding here, with $4 million being um, channeled through the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Climate Smart Commodities, and additional match of $500,000 from the New York State Environmental Protection Fund and Regenerate New York. So the total here will be $4.5 million of funding. Um, Again, this is a reimbursement grant. Costs are going to need to be upfronted by the awardee and then claimed back from DEC. It can be on a quarterly or annual basis through a voucher, uh, but based on you need the money, you can reach out to us. And we're pretty good about making sure we get those funds back to you as soon as possible. Uh, one of the big things we'll point out, and you'll see again and again in this presentation, there is no funding match um, from bidders. So this is a 100% reimbursement grant opportunity. <clears throat> So the purpose of this webinar is really to help um, give some explanation on the funding um, and the amounts available to folks uh, and give an idea of the projects available, provide our landowners and our bidders with tips on planning and how to submit applications. <clears throat> so if we can mute people, thank you. Um, uh, we also hope to reach landowners to give them an idea and other organizations um, to really get down to what is in what is um, termed in the afforestation efforts that we're getting we're going through, um, and as well, if you if you aren't on the DEC delivers, we have been sending out notes on the ELF as well as other grant opportunities through DEC delivers. So you can sign up for that grant opportunity through DEC's website. Uh, and this is just a nice photo of um, some folks who are getting ready to do planting. Uh, just like to keep that in there, show everybody what's going to be coming down the pipeline. If you have any questions or um, just need some answers as we're going through the overall application process, not necessarily for this webinar, uh, you can lead, feel free to reach out with any questions for bids or app, uh, requirements, contract terms, procedures. Please feel free to reach out to the large forests at dec.ny.gov. Again, don't forget that last S. Uh, I've seen a couple emails that haven't gone through because people are just putting large forest instead of large forest. So make sure you leave that, keep that S in if you want to get to us. Uh, and if you have any SFS questions, you can reach out to the help desk at sfs.ny.gov or that toll free number there. And I believe that information is all on our website as well. So you won't miss it if you don't get it here. Um, here is a good idea of the timeline of some important dates that we're looking for as we're going through so you guys can kind of plan things out. Uh, the bidding term, as you know, has already started, started October 30th, um, last Wednesday. Or two Wednesdays ago now. Oh, geez, time's flying. Uh, the public webinar, as you know, is going on right now. Uh, question and answer period for the grant will go through Thursday, January 2nd. Uh, and bids are due five days later, Tuesday, January 5th by 3 p.m. Uh, so there's a five day difference between when questions and answer closes and then when the actual bids are due. Um, it, I know I put the Monday, July 1st as, a, a hard, <laughs> as an award announced, but we all know through the state that it's probably not going to be that hard of a deadline. It'll hopefully be sometime beginning of July that we'll get awards out, um, but we'll see how that actually works out. Uh, and we are looking at this is going to be a three year contract term, um, and that's not three years to have the, the funds um, uh, covered. It's actually to have them uh, not impounded, I should say, uh, but they actually have the money spent. So we're making sure that people are putting in good projects to make sure we can get the money out the door. Um, some anticipated project timelines, if you are awarded, after that, the project planning would really just start July 25 through July 26th. 
which would allow you some time to get your trees, get your site ready, do some vegetation, invasive species control work, get your fencing up, get the site ready for planting. Um, but we're really seeing the target for plantings to happen um, start of spring 2027. Although if you've been doing work and everything's aligned and there's all the miracles have happened and you got things ready to go, fall 2026 could be the time you get a, a planting started if you're ahead of the game. Uh, and the primary work window will then be that following 2027 to 2028 springtime. And then the contract will actually be closed out April, May, 2028. So it is a pretty pretty tight turnaround, um, but we're, we're gonna make sure that we get uh, as much of these projects as we can get to. Um, and unfortunately, we are not anticipating any extensions. Um, the times we've spoken with our federal com uh, colleagues on this one have been met with stony stairs. So don't anticipate any extensions on this. We really wanna get things done in the three year time window. It looks like we do have a couple of um, clarification questions for timeline. Absolutely. Um, does DEC anticipate being under contract with recipients by early July or within 60 days of announcement? So the awards will be announced by the July period. Um, I think we're going to figure out contracting will be after that point, um, but it'll run concurrent with the federal review. Um, one thing I haven't really touched on is the federal requirements here. Um, we're going to get all the state stuff done and out of the way ahead of the up front. Uh, which would take about two to three months to get you really to that award period. But then it's about enough federal, so federal people have told us it's going to be six to nine months of federal review to get through actually all of their um, requirements that we have to get taken care of. But contracting will run concurrent to that period. So it'll kind of be award and then you go through the contracting stuff and then, con and then the actual implementation, implementation period starts. Great. And another one is, will you be taking all bids, um, you know, bid applications until it closes and then deciding which projects to fund in the summer of 2025, or will it be rolling decision? I guess more similar to the Regenerate New York grant. This will not be rolling. This will be the hard deadline of January 7th. Great. Um, another question is, will pre-award costs be allowed to start uh, around July 1st, 2025, or do you think it'll take longer to get contracts in place than that date? Then the July... Let me help you with that one, Ian. Yeah, go ahead, Michelle. Uh, if the award date is early July, and we will try and get it out earlier than that, the actual award announcement, usually it takes people at least 30 to 60 days to get the insurance and all the other requirements in, although with this grant, there's not, not an awful lot. So I would anticipate the contract term will start in September, um, and at which time, even if you don't, you won't have an executed contract by then, but you will be able to start at your own risk. Uh, but we just can't pay any vouchers until you've got an executed yeah. contract. So award, if we that. award in July, contract term starts in September, expect an executed contract November, December, that, that should do it. And I think this slide that I just put up actually was the next one that <laughs> gets a little bit further into that uh, and explains that kind of approximate August, September, 2025 is the contract term through April, May, 2028. And again, I just broke it out and it shows you kind of what we're kind of earmarking timeline wise as far as things go through. Um, and again, we are urging bidders to carefully, please plan carefully and don't submit a, a, a bid unless you really are pretty confident that you're going to be able to get it completed in a three year contract term because there are not going to be any extensions that we're anticipating here. So just a, another head, a word of warning. And I think the last one, mm -hmm. Go ahead. potentially for now, there's a couple people asking, you might cover it here in, in the next couple of slides, I'm not sure, um, but can planting like, do you anticipate that planting might be able to be done in spring 2026 if the application applicants are ready? Yeah. Absolutely. If you've, if you've, yeah. it'll be past the contract term. Spring 2026, you should be well on your way. Mm -hmm. Real good, Mark? Yep. For now, thank you. Yep. Thanks.
Okay, so I did talk on touch on that project term one. Um, and I'd like to include this slide because people have been saying, hey, you know, what is the difference here? Uh, so we'll call that out. This is really focusing on just afforestation practices versus re, uh, Regenerate New York, which has four practices included in it. Uh, so afforestation is really looking at tree planting um, and not restoration work at all. Uh, so we did build a standard for this um, saying no tree tubes. And a lot of that was based on the acreage and the maintenance and time frames that are associated with tending tree tubes on plantings over five acres really almost comes cost prohibitive to use them. Um, same thing with deer fencing. Based on the acreage we're expecting to get and the size of things, we're just thinking deer fencing is gonna be the most efficient. Um, now, as anyone who practices forestry knows, everything is, it depends situation. So if there are nuances, please reach out to us um, at the large forests email, and, and we'll work with you to see if it is actually um, a good project for else. Um, and again, this is part of a federal funding grant through US uh, Climate Smart Commodities where we were awarded $13 million and we're only going out with $4 million of the federal funding. So there are an additional $9 million over the next three years that we're gonna look to get out. We haven't really figured out exactly where we're gonna take that additional $9 million, but a lot of it has been focusing on restoration. Um, so keep your eyes and ears peeled and we'll have some stuff coming out about that one as well. Um, and again, one of the major differences is that federal component. Um, there is a lot of federal requirements we have to go through. Um, one of the big ones is that awardees on this grant will be required to get an FSA ID number, a track number, and a parcel number. And those things are only attainable through an FSA office. Um, we have put the offices, um, a link to the offices in the RFP, uh, so you can find out where they are. Uh, but you do actually have to go to the office to get those. Um, but since we are plant, we are targeting open acreage and idle lands, hopefully maybe some bidders will actually already have that uh, in their possession. So it will speed things up as well as the CP2 environmental review, which is a new thing, a new review that we'll be doing uh, tied to the environment, uh, to the federal requirements. Um, and just so you're aware, uh, through our discussions with the Fed, um, they've let us know that initial CPA 52 reviews uh, should take up to eight hours a piece to do. So not a simple thing. Hopefully we'll be able to get pretty efficient at them. Um, but so just so you know, there is a lot of review that goes into this. Uh, again, calling out difference between Regenerate New York, there is no match required here. This is a 100% reimbursement uh, grant. Um, there is a scoring component here. So please read through the questions and make sure you're aware of the, the, the scores associated with them and really try to make sure you um, make it efficient to play on those, those scores. Because I think cost effectiveness is 20% alone in this in scoring, although there is no cost effectiveness question itself. It's all measured in a series of questions. And project size, you'll see project size is a big part of this as well. Um, so please make sure you read through everything and you're aware of what the scoring is so you can really tackle everything. Um, I saw Sue, um, I saw something pop up. Sue, uh, um, the state does it. I think I'm actually going to be the one doing the CPA 52 reviews. Uh, so you can take that one off the list, Molly. Uh, we get into the eligible bidder. So we've gone through all of this. Who can actually apply? Uh, private landowners who are non-industrial. Uh, if you have a question about the non-industrial component, uh, it's really uh, from what we can get a gauge on, it really has to do with an acreage total. Uh, and industrial landowners based on the Fed usually are in ownership of several thousand acres. So not necessarily something we're probably targeting here. Smaller landowners are probably gonna be the, 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 the main focus. Um, companies and organizations are free to act on um, non-industrial landowners behalf. Uh, so those organizations can be quasi-government agencies like soil water conservation districts, who we really see as a huge potential partner here. Uh, land trusts, another huge potential partner who can either be the bidder or they can actually be the landowner themselves. Private forestry businesses or natural forest, natural resource businesses. Uh, if you have a question on that, uh, there is a question that says you have to upload your CV. So as long as you have a forestry background or natural resource education, uh, forestry education, and then a professional experience, you should meet the quals for those. Um, so just to kind of give you a, a brief background on that one. Also not-for-profit corporations, are allowed to apply. Uh, we do want to call it out to bidders who are acting on other people's behalf that you are taking on the full responsibility of the project when you're taking this on as a, as a, um, 
of someone who's acting on as a fiscal res, uh, you know, fiscal rep. So you are taking on the full responsibility for the contract. Really nice to know. So let's get into some of the project areas because I think some of the questions we've gotten have been on that. Um, so we'll touch on it briefly here as we go through. So obviously the project property needs to be within New York State. Um, please don't ask if it can go outside New York State. Um, eligible projects will need to be on one or more contiguous properties and they must establish forests through plantings on at least five acres or more of private ownership. I will get more into that little caveat. There's a slide that explains that a little bit better. Um, bidders will be uh, required to upload a map um, in SFS Grant Gateway. I think it's eligibility question 10. Um, please no hand-drawn maps. Please use digital maps and, and good quality pictures. I'm going to decline the request to annotate. Please reach out to the comments if you need to. Um, <clears throat> ineligible locations um, are lands owned by the state, county, city, or other municipalities um, would not be eligible for this grant. Molly, any questions you want me to go over? Um, someone was asking, do the maps have to be GIS compatible? or PDFs? Um, so, uh, so I think we're, we're PDFs. Everything are, in PDF, please. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So, uh, th and that is because when SFS grant system goes through and scrapes all of the bids, it will only pull through other PDFs to the PDF. So if you enter a document that is not a PDF, it won't get pulled. Um, so good to point that out here too. Uh, so make sure you're aware that anything you're uploading is a PDF. But we'll get more into the upload process. So, and Brett will answer all those questions as we go. Uh, so, the minimum project amounts um, the minimum project amount we set at $30,000 with the maximum project amount. Again, key term project amounts here, not bid amount, but project amounts with the maximum being $750,000. We kind of set the, the minimum based on our five acre kind of threshold and then what we've seen through Rate Regenerate New York. For cost for reforestation is between five to six thousand per acre. So you do the math, you get about thirty thousand dollars as your minimum. The seven fifty uh, was kind of a bit more arbitrary. Um, <laughs> we kind of just thought what was the biggest project we could imagine, and seven fifty was the term that we saw for that one. Um, if someone submits a bid, you can submit one bid with several projects, and that's where the caveat comes in. You can have one bid with several projects that are each 750 or anything below that for a total bid amount of what the, whatever the total set award would be. So you don't have to worry about the 750. That's more project based rather than bid based. Uh, and there's a good graphic I have coming up here that will show you kind of how the, the projects can be laid out in a bid. So this is an example of one bid with several projects in it. Uh, the first project is a couple contiguous properties that you were looking to plant, say, I don't know, however many acreage, and that acreage doesn't need to be contiguous within the parties. You can do five acres in the northeast corner, 10 acres in the southeast corner for a total 15 acre planting, um, as long as it's on properties that are owned contiguously. Uh, again, so another project in the same bid, it's a single property where they're just looking to do five acres, that's fine, another single property of five acres, and they found uh, another property, another project that had a couple. So this would be something like maybe a soil and water conservation district would come up with. They have a couple people that they're already working with. They have these properties. They can group them together into one bid with several projects. Kind of how we spell that out. Uh, I'm guessing there's going to be comments on that one. So I'll, I'll pause as I, after I've gotten through the slides. If anybody has any questions on those, I'll, I'll address that now. Looks like we have a raised hand. Okay. Michelle, can you unmute them? I can't see that at the moment. Hello? Yep, are you there? Go ahead. Yes, um, I've got a bit of a question regarding the bidding um, process. So mm -hmm. you say that you can lump um, various um, properties within um, uh, multiple various um, lands or parcels within um, the same bid mm -hmm. for, um, for I guess, to reach that five acre threshold. 
if I may ask, um, is it preferable that um, when um, you guys review it or the DC reviews it, it's basically can it does it have to be various parcels with under the same landowner or could it be multiple parcels under multiple landowners? That's the first question that I have. Yeah, so this should be under this. I believe this is all under the same landowner. Okay. Yeah, because then the next question would have been is that um, if this was under um, if this was like uh, multiple parcels under multiple landowners, mm -hmm. does that mean that you guys just really want to see one big application at the end of the year? Or um, if we have, for example, or if you want to do like um, each bid on a per landowner basis, um, we could put in multiple bids um, uh, for each landowner. So you could only submit one bid for the year. Per, per bidder. So, I mean, there's per year, there's only going to be one year of this, probably. This is kind of a one off. I don't think we'll necessarily see other iterations of the ELF grant coming out unless it's just a completely separate um, allocation of the $9 million that we have. So, let me put it to you this way if we have like three landowners, and let's say, and let's call them Tom, Dick, and Harry for the sake of argument. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, we want to and we ba and all three of them want to a four want to a forest uh, some uh, some plots of land that obviously let's see that meet and exceed the five acre one. We can only put, we can only put one bid in with all of those three different landowners for this um, for this program. We can't put three. I bids think I'm going to ask you, Christos, to actually submit this question to our email. Okay. Um, I, I, I prefer not to get into specific project details. Obviously, you have general questions. That's fine. But if we can kind of stay away from the individual projects or bid details and just submit those in an email and we'll address them. I just don't want to have to worry about making sure I'm covering too much here. Okay, that's, that's okay. Fine. I appreciate that. Thank you, Christos. Yep. Was there any other questions? Anything else there, Molly, or no? Nope, I don't see anything coming through yet. Okay, and you guys are seeing my screen correctly. Yep, it's back up. Okay. Perfect. All right, so we'll get into the next one here. And thank you for your questions, guys. I appreciate it. Much nicer than just hearing me talk the whole time. Oh, um, some specific grant requirements here. Um, obviously, there will be various things you'll have to update, like your proof of ownership, your location maps, your pictures of the property, your project templates, cost estimates, um, uh, sexual harassment forms. All of these things can be found in the bid document. Um, there's a checklist of submission things that you can find in Appendix 2, as well as throughout the document. Um, and you will want to go through and just make sure you get that checklist and have all those things pulled out. So when you go into the actual bid, you're kind of pretty aware of what you have to go through and make sure everything's getting taken care of. Um, and again, there will be some additional things after the fact, like an NBWE or NWBE uh, insurance certificates. And then, like, I, we, as we've discussed, the federal requirements as well. It looks like we have another raised hand. Let me see. I think I okay. can unmuted. Yep. Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go right ahead. Yeah, hi, my name is Mark Palczewski. I'm on the CAC in the town of Montgomery. How mm -hmm. do we get this information to the private landowners? Um, to have, so they were aware of this bid. Uh, so feel free to share the website with them. Um, I mean, we've done DEC delivers, which goes out to all of the public. Uh, we've done social media blast as well. Um, there's been a couple other iterations of the media we've put out as well. But is there um, something, I mean, cause I don't know all the landowners and I don't know, you know, their acreage and, and what their, their land is and what their intention is. So how would, how would we get in the, the town? If anyone was interested, how would we get that information to them? Uh, how would, I guess they would have to request it. I mean, if, yeah. Yeah, but if they, if they're, I guess my question is, if they're not aware of it, how would they know to request it? Like, uh, yeah, that's one of the struggles we have is making sure our outreach is getting to everybody who needs to be aware. Um, but if there's only so much we can do to make people aware. Yeah, okay. Um, yeah, so I mean, unless people are coming to you looking for opportunities, then you can present them with this opportunity. Like I said, we are putting it in um, public locations so people can find it. Um, if you Google, 
establishing large forests or DEC grants, the grant page would have a list of all that stuff as well. I mean, is, um, is this something that maybe would go to would better go to town officials? Um, I can bring it up to the town officials, but I mean, uh, please feel free to distribute the opportunity to as many people as you see fit. However, yeah. your connections have, and we don't have a way to get to everybody. Gotcha. Okay. So we are relaying on um, a lot of our partners to distribute this as wide as possible. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for the question. Anything else while we're paused? Not really to this part yet. Great. Thanks. Uh, so, yep, again, this is just another kind of a dip uh, toe into the uh, some grant requirements just to make people aware uh, that we are um, make, having people provide access to our forestry staff, obviously, to get out there and do inspections as they need, but as well as SUNY College environmental ESF uh, staff and students, Cornell staff and students, so they can do um, some research on the properties. Uh, there is the question in there that, let, that marks off that you will be allowing people to come out there and check on stuff. And a lot of it is to kind of have the research support the efforts that we're putting out there and then in circle having our efforts support the research so we can actually see New York based research um, on the ground and supporting our efforts. Here's another highlight of the federal term federal requirements again, just kind of throwing it at you guys as many times as possible. So you are aware of them. Um, again, you have to meet the erodible land and wetland conservation requirements. Uh, you have to have control of the land. Uh, for the term of the contract, uh, again, maintain the project year for 10 years post completion, uh, be a U.S. citizen, uh, do all the other FSA stuff that we've talked about, have us complete the CPA 52 and all those other things. So there's a lot of stuff that is federally required here. Um, uh, if you have any of the citizenship issues, uh, we can talk about that in an email and we'll work with the federal partners to figure out the answers. So if you have anything that's specific to those questions, just reach out to us and we'll We'll help you get the answers. <clears throat> All right. So the actual main practice here is going to be an afforestation centric practice. So we're really looking at getting um, trees and stems in the ground. And a lot of what we based it off of was the NRCS practices. Um, and how those things align. So we really kind of mirrored the, the federal NRCS practices to kind of get this um, aligned. And the goal of the grant really, again, is to get large scale is one of the things we were trying to do large forests is large scale shovel ready tree planting projects that can move quickly. Um, they do need to be guided by a forester, a private forester or a natural resource professional. Um, a list of our um, consulting foresters can be found online. Uh, and a natural resource professional is anyone who has a professional background and uh, documented education. For species, we are going off the Department of Tax and Finance commercial tree species list. Um, now, again, we know that there will be uh, situations where maybe something on that list or something that's not on that list might be better. I think we had somebody ask us about Japanese larch. Um, and being a fan of larch, I love the species and it does a great job on reforestation areas. Um, it does a great job of allowing regen to grow in behind it. Uh, it's not on the list, but something that if you put in your, your, um, your justification for why you want it and your species list, we would have the conversation. Um, and again, another big component of that, uh, something we're running into a lot is actually what's available, the species that are available may not be what people want. So we will have to work with people on that a little bit. Uh, to make sure that we can get the proper plant material to people um, and they're going to the right places uh, to get it. And we really want to make sure that these um, are resilient to the future. So it may allow the option uh, to, again, increase certain things that uh, you want to put in there. Uh, so I'll kind of I just got to note that we're kind of running low on time, so I'll keep going. Um, this is a list of the NRCS rates that this is based off of. Um, in the RFB is a, is a link to this, and we put the page numbers here so you can get right to it. Again, these practices cannot establish or maintain or, orchards, ornamental nurseries, or Christmas tree farms. As you can tell, my pace is picked up because uh, we got some extra slides to go through. Uh, here is an um, example of a project that was done through Re, uh, Regenerate New York. It's Kurt Brian, uh, Bynum's project. Uh, and it gives you an idea of what we're looking at kind of over the top. Um, the fencing that was around at the site implementation that was taken care of it looks like they were spraying. They also put down some uh, landscaping fabric to keep things away. Um, 
but again, rental equipment, temporary water infrastructure, all those supplies that would need to go into it um, are part of the tree planting things you would be able to put in there uh, that would be covered costs. You can see our tree planting guidelines in there. Those are in the R. Ooh, that went fast. Um, they're in the RFB as well, so I won't necessarily cover on those guys, but you know they're there in the RFB if you need them. Again, a couple of just a really good overviews of a couple of planting projects. Again, Kurt Bynum's another shot of that one. Uh, and this one on Slate Hill uh, that showed. And this one's a cool one too, because they did something innovative here. They actually planted sunflowers and then harvested them, left the stems to provide a nurse things for the, the plantings that were going in for the, the stems to come up. Uh, and they were gonna leave the stems in to provide that kind of nurse structure. So really cool, innovative thing uh, that somebody was going through to do. So we wanna see that innovation as well. Deer fencing, uh, we did set the standard at deer fencing. Again, that was for maintenance costs. And we did set some of the justifications we wanna see for the standard. If anything is gonna fall out of that and has a justification, please include it in the narrative and let us know. And we'll, we'll discuss it with you, but you can see some of the fencing that we put in there. Um, all of the costs are eligible materials that go into that as well. Uh, oops, something to call out is uh, the bear fencing. Um, if it's in, if you have bear that's going through there and they can wreak havoc on fencing, if you want to upgrade it to a bear fencing, please demonstrate the need, provide the justification, and we'll work with you on that one. Uh, some things that we didn't mention in there was gravel mulch. Uh, if you have moles or voles or mice or rabbits, um, gravel mulch can be something. A beer can around the stem is another thing. Uh, cardboard for competing vegetation. All of these things are things you can use that may cut down on your costs, but would be acceptable practices. Again, if you want to find anything else that's innovative, you just need to provide some kind of um, ed, uh, some resource, a peer reviewed resource that shows why you're doing it. Oh, looks like I kept the slide in, so I'll skip that one again. Uh, some more examples of deer fencing. Uh, a couple things I'll point out is just how it's attached. Not everybody's putting in posts, some is attaching it right to the trees. Um, some are putting in those metal posts, some are putting in some old wood posts. Uh, in the bottom left and bottom right, you'll see some other things that were included. Um, there was some available slash for these properties, so they did include it as an additional buffer along the fence line to kind of help, uh, again, deter um, wildlife from getting in there. I, I don't see there being a biomass because there's no harvesting really associated with this practice, so I don't necessarily think you'll have biomass on site to do this, uh, but we want to include that it, if something is unique to the situation, we'll work with you on it. Uh, more site prep. Again, if you have to do any tilling or mow, uh, forestry mowing, uh, if you've got a lot of barberry, Japanese knotweed, I uh, mean, not Japanese knotweed, because that would spread. Sorry, that just kind of came off the head. Uh, what was I thinking? Honeysuckle. Yeah, honeysuckle. Um, those would be prime for doing some kind of forestry mowing to reclaim the site. Um, go through that. Some more shots of some things that were done for Regenerate New York that would qualify here. I did one so um, monitoring and measuring and monitoring again for bare root stock um, for five to 14 inches. We are looking for a 65% survival rate that will be needed to maintain through the life of the project. Uh, and if you're going with something like a potted thing, it'd be 75% uh, success uh, for that containerized stock. Um, and you will need to maintain the fencing and all the deer exclusion or browse exclusion for 10 years. Um, again, we will need to get out to the project site to do inspections to make sure that um, things are happening and that to make sure that the payments are going through uh, for work that has been done. You will have a three year contract term. Again, we've kind of really covered all this stuff. Um, so I really won't go into too much more of that. Um, but I think this is where I hand it off to Michelle. Well, thank so, you, Ian. Yeah, thank you, Michelle. That was wonderful. And uh, uh, good morning, everyone. So this application for ELF in um, the state financial system uh, grants management is uh, broken up into three application areas. The first one is the eligibility questions, which are all your forms and the yes, no questions. So if you, you have to get through that successfully in order to be reviewed. So um, work carefully through it. Uh, there's an appendix list at the back of the document, appendix two, that gives you the checklist. So make sure that you upload all those. 
uh, forms. Brad uh, will show you on SFS uh, how to upload forms um, next to the question. Um, and then the second part is the project evaluation. You want to be a B to a B plus student um, to get through this application successfully. Um, you'll see in the bid document in uh, point eight with all the all how how the reviewers are going to evaluate each question. So that gives you all the clues and all the hints that you need. So if you see the question has uh, 20 points and you write three sentences, you're not going to get 20 points, you're going to get zero points. Um, and there's not a lot of questions. I think there's only seven questions, six or seven questions. So put everything you've got into each question. If you have to repeat things, that's just, that's just fine. Redundancy is just fine with this sort of thing. And then the third area is the cost effectiveness. So um, the cost effectiveness is evaluated by us, but you need to read everything in that cost effectiveness area so you know what to tell us. Uh, for instance, um, when you go to get your estimate from the tree nursery, um, say if you're going to Schichtel's tree nursery, for instance, uh, they'll give you a long list of all the species they've got. You'll tick off which ones you've got, but put the total down the bottom. Um, that's the difference between cost effective and not cost effective. We're not going to sit there and add up everybody's uh, subtotals until we get a total. So the clarity in the in the estimates is really important. If your forester is going to purchase the trees for you um, and they're going to pick them up, deliver them, install them, etc., they're going to we're going to need a breakdown of the costs, and we're still going to need the estimate from the original nursery. Uh, we want to see that basic wholesale price or retail price. So um, what we suggest is that um, download download all your oh, I'm sorry type all your questions onto a word document, and then when you're really ready, copy and paste everything into SFS Grants Management. If you've already got if you've already had state grants before, you will have a supplier ID. And all you need to do is go to the help desk, give them the supplier ID and your name and address, and uh, tell them that you're applying for a grant and that you need um, you need the roles uh, and you need the user ID in order to get into SFS GM. So we'll go over this in a minute with with Brad as well. Um, if you're brand new to uh, the state grants, um, you'll go straight to the help desk and. Uh, tell them that you're applying for a grant and uh, they'll send you a registration form and you'll go from there. Um, what else can I tell you? So you can do that at the same time. Start working on the grant. First of all, download the uh, bid document, either print it out or download it so you can look at it. It's 36 pages long. It's well worth reading the whole thing um, before you get started and then um, do your SFS thing at the same time. So I know that sounds like a lot. <laughs> Let's go to the next slide, Ian. So yes, the project evaluation questions are scored by at least three people and they come from different uh, walks of um, uh, DEC life. So you might have a forester, a, a grants administrator, and um, uh, whoever else uh, will, will be reviewing these. So it's people that are knowledgeable about the um, area and people that are knowledgeable about uh, cost effectiveness. So we don't want you to hurry, give yourself plenty of time, but you know we've got holidays coming up and the um, bid must be submitted before um, June, was it June 7th? June 7th. So don't leave it till the last minute. Um, uh, I would try and get it in at least a week prior uh, and give, give yourself plenty of time to check everything. So um, I think that's pretty clear. Let's go to the next slide, Ian. 
Okay, so the, the cost effectiveness, the cost effectiveness area is also in several parts. You've got the work plan, and you've got the um, objectives, tasks, and performance measures. So the work plan becomes um, next slide, Ian, please. There we go. So the work plan becomes part of the contract. Now you can put all the answers to your um, project questions straight into the work plan in SFS or into your Word document and then it can go into the SFS. You don't have to rewrite everything. Uh, but there'll, there'll be things that we haven't asked you that you want to tell us. Um, like, you know, the history of the property, um, how you've come about uh, to this grant. You know, tell us the whole story in the work plan. And then you'll see objectives, tasks, and performance measures. And this is where you'll put in, you may only have three um, objectives. One will be site preparation. The second one will be tree planting. The third one will be monitoring and maintenance. And in this part of the application, well, really, you know, while you're answering all the project related questions, by this time, you want to have a forester helping you. You want to have hired the forester. They'll know all the background that needs to go in there by looking at the questions. So don't try and tackle all that yourself. Make sure you've got a dedicated professional um, helping you and by which time they will have already uh, been to your property and uh, had a look at everything. So back to the objectives for a minute. Um, you, this is how you're going to walk it through and this is really valuable for us to see how you are going to approach the project. And this area, the objectives, tasks, and performance measures also becomes your future progress report. So while you're applying for this um, grant opportunity, you're going to assume that you're going to get this and you're going to write to us as if you are getting this grant and showing us what the future of the grant is going to look like, how you're actually going to work things through. So. Um, think positive and uh, there's plenty of money so if if everybody gets a good percentage theoretically you've got to get over 70 percent to be awarded a grant um, which would be a b or a b plus so uh, that's the level that we're expecting um, check all your all your expenses are eligible uh, there's nothing kooky in there you haven't tried to charge us for tree tubes um, you'll see when Brad goes into the budget area of the um, SFS grants management, um, he'll show you exactly how to put your expenses in there. Um, next one, Ian. Okay, I think I've actually covered all this. Um, yes, walk the project through with the forester. This is good. Um, next one, please. Okay, so just to just to wrap up the cost effectiveness area, it is 20% of the total score. It's really vital uh, that everything is in line. Um, good estimates or quotes are required. A an estimate is not something you're getting from a website unless you're getting it, you know, you might be getting fencing parts or something from Home Depot. That's okay to do that. But estimates from a forester, uh, estimates from a nursery, we really need to see detail of what is going to be purchased. The more detail you can give us in that area, the higher the score you will get. And just to reiterate, there's no match for this grant. Um, I think we're nearly ready for questions. Ian, if you go to the next slide. Yep. So good luck, everybody. Uh, I'll throw it back to Ian for uh, any final questions, and then we'll um, introduce Brad, and he'll uh, give us the ITS tour. Yeah, we'll probably give a few minutes here for questions. Um, I know there's a bunch in the chat who have been looking at it. Um, so please feel free to go ahead and tap and raise your hand if you can. Um, so one question I've seen come through quite a lot is, can dead tree clearing, such as ash and invasive species removal, be part of site preparation before planting? Uh, yes, the joyous answer of foresters. It depends. Again, as I mentioned earlier, it really depends on what the current site condition is. If you're really doing a heavy restoration amount of work, 
that's probably not going to meet the parameters here. However, if it's, so I've used this example a little bit in discussions. If you had a harvest 15, 20 years ago and the regeneration all failed, and now you have just an open site under it, that would probably fit in. Um, however, if you have an ash registration and you have maybe 30 square feet of basal area on the ground um, of other things alive, that probably wouldn't hit the parameters for this grant. Great. Um, I've seen a lot of questions about species. Um, one of them is, can they include shrubs or small trees like willows and native plums in their planting list? Uh, yep. So we did include in the RFP a, um, a component for 10% of shrubby species to be included in a planting list. And that was, again, to boost our chances of survival and success. So yes, there is a 10% uh, shrubby species component. And to add to that, somebody asked about ground cover. So I'm thinking like maybe perennial herbaceous species, are they included? I'm sorry, I missed that one. Sorry, one more time, Molly. Sure. Um, somebody also just asked about like understory, like ground cover species, like perennial herbaceous species. Are they included? Perennial herbaceous would not. We're really looking at like shrubby and actual tree stems here. So not grasses or things of that nature. Unless maybe it was a cover crop. I'm sorry. Yes. Unless you're doing some kind of a cover crop that would probably fit in um, based off the NRCS rates. Yeah. And um, a couple other species that were specifically asked about were black locusts, Chinese chestnuts, and bald cypress. It's hard to talk specific species because we don't know what the project or site or any of the, the components of it is. Um, again, if you, you need to provide a justification in your narrative and make sure that the justification for, is, includes resources that are documented. Um, but we will probably have the conversation if it was not a species from the, the list, that we, the commercial list that we included. Um, yeah, so there's a question there about discrepancies in cost effectiveness compared to NRCS costs um, that Scotty has answered. Isn't there, um, aren't, aren't we assuming that NRCS is the, it's like 75%? Yes. So NRCS rates only cover, only are projected to cover 75% of the cost. So when you were actually laying out a project bid, you would you would account for that additional 20% in your bidding. So when you're writing a project bid, you would include that additional 20% because NRCS rates only cover the 75. And I think we have a note on that in the RFB as well as a link to the NRCS practices page. Um, all of that stuff is right in the RFB. So if the NRCS quote is $75, it's okay for their estimate to be $100, which would be 25% more. Uh, so I think it's, I think you would have to do it more on the, if you got a quote for $100, NRCS would only cover 75. But you, you have to work almost backwards and not necessarily going forwards on that one. You get your quote and then understand how much they would cover. But yes, but do build that into your bid amount when you're, you're doing it, the NRCS is only planning. The, when we were laying it out, the NRCS rates were only covering 75% of it. So yes, there is some additional rate you would want to build in there. Um, another question is on food forests. Um, if the tree is already on the approved list, is it okay to try to establish a food forest? <laughs> um, again, I think these are really kind of project specific questions that it's kind of hard to answer. I'm not sure exactly what the site, what your species mix is, uh, how big of an area you're looking to plant. There's a lot of questions that go into that. So it's kind of hard to answer some of these one off questions that way. Um, if you do have one off questions, please just reach out to us and we'll, we'll get you an answer via the email. Or calls, we may get back to you via phone calls too as well. Um, another question is on um, do the applicants have to use five to 14 inch seedlings? Um, there's some interest in using two to three foot stock for some planting. Um, so the ones that we included in the bid were just to, to present a standard. If you have any differentiations from that standard, just reach out to us so we're aware um, and we'll work with you and we'll talk about and, and see what the actual iterations are. I know there's a lot of different nurseries that are producing different size stock and different containerized stock. 
So just let us know what you're thinking and we'll have a discussion. Um, there's been also a lot of questions about the 10 year um, maintenance requirement for landowners. Um, what sort of maintenance are we expecting for that project or I guess like ownership? Yeah, so this one's kind of uh, a little bit of a challenge to go into. So you are expected to maintain the 65% survival rate for this for the planted species for the 10 years. Um, how often or if we come back or if the Fed comes back is kind of hard to tell. Um, we haven't been great about doing those 10 year follow ups, any of them along the way. So I don't really want to get into that. Um, but again, we, we do want to make sure that you guys aren't just putting stuff in the ground uh, and then walking away from it. Uh, so for the three years and then after, we want to make sure that there's really success and that we're not just spending money for no reason. So again, yeah, I know there's a lot of caveats to the 10 year thing, like how long do we have to do it? Is it really going to happen? Um, if you're putting cheese in the ground, we want to make sure they survive. So that's kind of, I'll, I'll leave it at that. Um, so if you have already been uh, qualified through Regenerate New York to be kind of your oversee your own project, is it the same qualifications for this project as like natural resource professionals? Yes, for natural resource professionals, it would be very similar. Yep, if not the same. Mm -hmm. Is there a policy on including non-commercial species to support like biodiversity or like some sort of expectation on hardwood woods versus conifers for reforestation? There's no policy on it. Um, we try to avoid being overly prescriptive. Yeah, pres we're going to wrap up. This is probably the last question. Okay, Molly. Um, uh, where was I going? Sorry, I just got hurried up. Um, can you ask me that again, just real quick? I lost my train of thought then. Uh, biodiversity and thinking about hardwoods versus conifers and mixed species. Uh, again, a lot of that will come down to site specifics. Uh, what you can get to as far as availability of plant material. Again, that's really the big crux that we're running into uh, is what's even available on the market to buy. So really want to research that a lot. Uh, we understand there are going to be some differences, but we had to create a standard. So that was the standard we went with. I'm not sure if I answered that correctly or thoroughly enough. And I am going to be compiling a list of questions we haven't gotten to, too. So okay. can send that along yeah. again and maybe you can okay. get back to people. Yep, sure. And I, I would imagine, too, that some of these will be covered and put into the Q&A document that we'll post online as well. Okay, so I think at that point we'll, we'll hold on the rest of the questions and uh, let Brad kick off his uh, part of the presentations. All right, thank you, Ian. Um, let me share my screen here quick. Quick introduction. Uh, my name is Brad McMillan. I work with ITS in the Grants Management Unit. Um, we provide technical support and training for the SFS system. Um, maybe some of you have heard me do this in the past uh, with Grants Gateway, doing the same thing. Um, this will be some new steps that I'll try to introduce for those who are new to the system and hopefully some tips and tricks along the way for those who have already used SFS for applying for grants. So I wanna start um, with our grants management website. I know uh, Michelle touched a little bit on registration. To follow up on that, grantsmanagement.ny.gov is your starting point. If you're a new user, your organization does not have an account in SFS, I recommend starting this today. And I recommend that for the whole process. I know, uh, Ian and uh, Michelle's touched on this. It's the biggest piece of advice we can give people is start early. The number one mistake we see for people missing the deadline, not getting in a good application is starting too late. Um, you can't start too early. If you haven't started, I would recommend today, especially with the new SFS system. It's new for everyone. So if you're new, maybe you've used it for Regenerate New York, maybe you've done the process already, but please start early. If you're looking to register, maybe you're an individual, not-for-profit, whatever the case may be, you can come to this grantsmanagement.ny.gov website. And just move over to get started. 
This is where all the information you're going to need to get registered. You see, we have the tab register your organization. And everything you need to register is on this page. Um, we have instructions on how to register the instructions. Registration help and forms to download. So if we go to forms to download. The registration form, the substitute W9. Michelle mentioned vendor ID numbers. If you're a new organization, you don't have a vendor ID number. We'll get one for you. We're just going to fill out this registration form and the substitute W9. All the instructions you need to do that again are here on our registration. Portion of the website grantsmanagement.ny.gov. I don't want to go into more detail than that because I'm, I'm assuming most people here are registered, but if you're new, you need to get registered. Here's where you're going to start. The second thing I want to mention briefly while we're on our grantsmanagement.ny.gov website, if you are a not for profit and you need to get pre qualified, here in the get started tab again, get pre qualified. Um, again, this is just for not for profits. If you're an individual, governmental entity, for profit, you are not required to complete this process. If you are a not for profit, you have to be pre qualified in SFS to submit your application. That's one big difference with SFS and Grants Gateway. Grants Gateway, the system would allow you to submit your application, whether you were pre-qualified or not. In SFS, if you are a not-for-profit, the system will not allow you to submit your application unless you are in a pre-qualified status. So again, this is another big step. If you are a not-for-profit, check your pre-qualification today. Don't wait until you know January, end of December. You got a week before this is due or days. Then you're trying to get pre-qualified. Take care of it now. You won't have to worry about it at the deadline. The biggest thing I want to show you here on this get pre-qualified page, though, is if we scroll down to required questions and documents, that's going to show you every document and every question you need to answer in the system. If you're new, you're just getting registered. You don't have to wait to figure out what you got to do in the system. Send in your registration forms, check out the required questions and documents. And it's going to show you everything you're going to need to upload. You can get these documents ready, all the questions you're going to need to answer. The other thing I wanted to show you quickly here is this free qualification manual. It's rarely used, but it is so beneficial as you're completing your pre qualification as a not for profit. The manual will show you every question. What the uh, pre qualification specialist will be looking for an explanation of all the documents. It's a very useful resource. It's very rarely used, but it's here on the get pre qualified page in the helpful resources. So, those are the 2 things I wanted to show you here on our grants management website. If you're looking to register, register your organization. You need information about pre qualification as a not for profit. It's here on the website. Very useful. So, another thing that you can do today without even being logged into the system, and uh, Michelle mentioned this earlier, is go to sfs.ny.gov. Again, maybe you're waiting to get registered. Uh, maybe you're working on your pre qualification. You don't have to have a username or login to access the RFP document on the SFS website. So, again, we're on sfs.ny.gov. I am not logged in. I can go right down here to the vendor portal login. Don't be worried. If you don't have a login, you don't need it to do this. We're going to click the login and we're going to look for this search for grant opportunities. We're going to click the link. And the biggest mistake we see here is people will, you're presented with these search fields. Uh, maybe you enter in some information. If you're off by a letter or a number, it's not going to find the grant opportunity you're looking for. We recommend leaving all those search fields blank. Just scrolling down the screen, you're going to be presented with a list of every grant opportunity that's been advertised in SFS. They'll all be here on the list. And this is another place I want to show you something we've learned in SFS and a big question we get along in the help desk. So if I scroll down, we see our grant, but we're going to pretend we don't see it. It's not there. I'm looking, I'm looking, I can't find it. In SFS, you have to be aware of these scroll bars. Because if you notice, if I scroll to the right now, this is showing me a list of 27, but if I go down, that's obviously not 27. We have an additional scroll bar here that will take us to the bottom of the list. 
So be aware of your font size, because if you notice, it's going to move. Staying in the way. Second. Can't get that to move. I was going to try to change my font size. There we go. If I decrease it, which is pretty small, I wouldn't I wouldn't typically use it this way. But now you see I have the full screen. I have full 27 and I can see my option over here of how many are on the screen. But just by enlarging it again, just a little bit. 75% now I lose part of the screen. So something to be aware of. If you don't immediately see it here, check your scroll bar, scroll to the right. And we'll see this, I think, in the application that we submit. You'll, oh yeah, in the budget, we'll see this. You'll often see these drop downs, and they're always located in the upper right hand corner here. Again, you may not immediately see it. That will give you the option to view more or view all. This is showing us all 27, so we don't need it here. But again, just be aware of the scroll bars and your font size. If you're looking for something on the screen, maybe you see in the manual and a handbook, and it's not there, check your scroll bars, check your font size. But we are looking for the Establishing Large Forest DEC grant. We see this right here in our list. Again, we're not logged in. You could do this right now. If we click the link, here's our announcement. So we get some very basic information about the grant opportunity. The questions and answers will be posted here. You'll see a link, click here. There's nothing here yet, but this is where that will be posted. And then we also have the opportunity to view the grant opportunity. By clicking this link, you're gonna open up a copy of the RFP document. And I know this was mentioned several times in the last hour, but it's a key document. This should be your first step. If you've already registered, you're pre-qualified, you wanna, have this document. You want to study it. It's going to give you helpful information to submit a good proposal. It will also give you all the questions that you're going to need. So again, without even logging in, we've accessed a lot of information here that you will need to submit a good proposal to DC. So quickly again, back to home. On the SFS page, going to click vendor portal login search for grant opportunities and scroll down the list to find the grant you're looking for establishing large forest that will give the option to open the RFP document and view it you won't be able to apply it will give you that information though so let's get logged into our SFS test environment and walk through these steps so I'm going to stop sharing briefly while I get logged in here. Okay, so we have logged into the SFS test environment. And there's a lot of things you're seeing here on the screen. If you have a, well, let's go to SFS coach first. I don't wanna get into the roles too much. We'll come back to that. But I do wanna point out this SFS coach training tile. And we're gonna walk through all the steps to enter in the information and submit your application. But I wanna show you some resources you can use along the way if you need any assistance. We're going to click on SFS coach. I'm going to recommend two things here. Page opens up here. So we see we're automatically presented with a lot of options here. But for our purposes today, submitting a grant application, I have two recommendations. Set up your search fields first as a training type and select a handbook, user manual with screenshots. And if we just put grantee here, I'm just doing this so you can limit your search. So we select handbook keyword grantee and click search. You're gonna have this grantee processing in SFS. It's a very useful manual. It's got tons of information in it. 
I have it open, so I just want to show you a couple of things here. We're obviously not going to read the whole manual. This will help you with many categories, you know, searching for bid events, subscribing to email notifications. We have pre-qualification, lots of very basic information that will get you started here. For our purposes today, responding to bid events, there's a whole section that will walk you through different budget types. This is expenditure budget, so you won't have to worry about performance or capital, but you will need to view the separate pages. As we scroll down, this is where I want to talk about a little difference between SFS and Grants Gateway, if you're familiar with the older system. They're both role-based. So if you remember Grants Gateway, you may have had two or three usernames, passwords, all that to do different tasks in the system. In SFS, you don't need that. It's all combined into one username and one password, but you may need to add additional permissions to that role to complete your task. So for initiating and submitting a grant, application or bid event in SFS, you will need a bid response initiator. And to submit, you will need a bid response submitter. And that's very clear. If you have the initiate, you will not be able to submit. Uh, my recommendation would be to add both. To add both, that's where you're going to contact your primary contact within your organization. If you do not have one or you do not know who that person is, email the SFS help desk and I'll pull that up um, the, the address. I know it's in the PowerPoint, but we'll show that again before we end. If you need any, maybe you haven't logged in SFS in years. Um, you need your password reset username, email the help desk and they'll get you going on that. But these are the two roles you need to initiate and submit bid response initiator and bid response submitter. Now, the following pages, if we scroll down, is going to cover all the steps you need to complete that grant application in SFS and submit. We're going to do a, a live presentation of that, so we're not going to scroll down any farther. So that was SFS Coach. Now, we're logged in here, and you see I have this grants management state tile on my home page. If you log in to uh, begin this process and you don't see this tile, that means you're probably not uh, in the correct role. So again, that's where you're going to reach out to your primary contact. If you don't know who that is, reach out to the help desk. They'll get you going in that direction. But you know right away, if you don't see this, you don't have the roles to initiate the application. Now let's go one step farther. Let's click this link, Grants Management State. Let me see again, we have several, several tiles here, several options. We are looking for bid event search. That's our next step to initiate our grant application. Now, maybe if you log in and you see pre-qualification application, maintain your information, but you're not seeing this one, again, that's a role issue. That, that tips you off right away. I don't have the right role. I need to contact my primary contact. If you are the primary contact, you can add it to your own role. Uh, so something to be aware of there. So we're gonna go to our bid event search. And it's going to look very similar to that first page we looked at that was, we weren't even logged in the system. Brad, can I ask you a question? Yes. A lot of the people, a great percentage of these people who are going to be applying are first time landowners. They're not part of an organization at all. So if they're going in for the first time, is their best move to go after they do their registration through grants, um, grants management? Um, then they should go to SFS to the help desk and say that they're starting, they're trying to uh, start an application. If, well, what I would recommend first, if you, if you've got a username and password, you're logged in, you're going to need to add roles to your, you're not, you're not going to initially get that submitter and initiate a role. Most so of these people to, won't have, they won't have a, a previous vendor ID. And that's where they go through the registration process. If okay. they don't have a vendor ID or anything, you're going to start at grantsmanagement.ny.gov, get started, and register your organization. Okay, so once yeah. they're registered, SFS will get back to them with a user ID and a temporary password and the basic um, roles that you just discussed. Yeah, and those basic roles won't include the ones you need to initiate a grant application. Those will need to be added by the primary contact. So if you get registered as an individual, 
you get your username and temporary password from SFS, your first step would be to go in and create those roles for yourself. Okay, and they can they can find out how to create the role by downloading the grantee user manual. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. And there's also, you know, if they wanted just a single version of it, I don't, I may not be able to grab this. Quickly, and they but... can always reach out to us for that. We can happily email it to them if they need help with creating roles. That's right. Easy. Yeah. Yep. Oh yeah, absolutely. If you have, if you need any assistance with that, you can uh, reach out to the help desk, um, and we'll be yep. glad to help you with that. Let me take okay. a stab at Thank this. Thank you, Brad. Oh, you're welcome. This may not work. Let's try. I know there is a condensed version of how to do that. I don't have the keyword off the top of my head here. So I'm not finding it immediately. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions, you get you get logged in, you got username and password, you need help creating roles, let us know at the help desk. We'll absolutely help you with that. So let's go back home. So we can repeat these steps again. So we're at home, grants management state. Again, if this is not here, you need help with your roles, let us know. We're going to go to bit event search. And like we were talking about, leave those search fields blank. Just scroll on down. You're going to find the grant you're looking for. But again, I want to show you this just as a reminder. You see, I don't see the full screen. If I scroll to the right, there's the list of 27 again. If I want to see the whole list, and this gets tricky, I have to scroll down with this one and then scroll down with this one. Or you could reduce your font size and see the whole screen. Just something to be aware of. Now we are. This webinar is for establishing large forest, but we are going to actually use, oh, let's see, I lost it because I scrolled down. The Regenerate New York as our example, because we have everything we need in there to show you how to use the system. Now, you notice here we have two links. We have the bit event ID, and we also have the grant opportunity name. If you click the grant opportunity name, you will see the basic information that we saw earlier, minus the view grant opportunity. There's no access to it here. We get our basic information, a link to the questions and answers, but no place to apply. We get this question all day at the help desk. I found my event, I clicked it, there's no way to apply. If we return to the search, to apply, you're gonna to wanna to click this bid event ID. So again, if you click the wrong one, you don't see apply, just return to the search. Click the bid event ID. You see our page looks different right away. For one, we see bid on event, which is what we're looking for here. Again, we have a description here. Let's ignore this in process. I'll show you that later. Um, our event ID, contact information, a brief description, event end date. Be aware of that. Um, please submit early and start early. But this is the page we want to be on to initiate a bid event. So let's do that. Let's click here. And here we are on our application. You see, it looks a bit different than Grants Gateway, but all the pieces are still here. They're just presented in a little different manner. Now, one big thing we get here at the help desk, again, a lot all day long, is if I go down here and I'm just going to type in response, click save for later, which is down at the bottom. Bid is not complete. Do we want to save it? Yes. Click OK. Now it's saying name is a required field. Name is a required field and bidder contact information. To save this application, the first thing you want to do, and these are required, I can click save all day long and it will not save until I complete these two things. My site project address, name, telephone number, and email. Dunn's number is not required. Most of you will not have one. Do not worry about it. You do not need to enter that. Organization website, not required. If you don't have a website, don't worry about it. You won't be required to enter that. But again, you will be required to enter in your site or project address and the name. So let's start with the site project address. Pretty self-explanatory here. Where is the project located?
to save that. Let's enter in our name. Phone number. Oops. No. Build. And an email address. Now, let's try that again. Let's go down and save for later, which is always going to be down here at the bottom. If it is not complete, we know that. So we're going to click OK. You notice now it's saving. So I saved my page. I have entered in all the required information to save the page. We have our project site address, and I'm just going to cover this because I just caught it out of the corner of my eye. Um, someone asked, how do we add multiple addresses on this project site address page? We have the plus button. It's going to give you an address. You see now we have one of two, two of two. You can enter in another address here. I'm not going to finish that, but I just wanted to show the plus button if you need to do that. Go ahead and delete the current one, and we're left with the one. So we've saved our application. And I'm going to show you now, because we get this again, just a question we get a lot at the help desk is, I saved my application and I can't find it. I logged out, I went and had lunch, I came back, it's gone. So let's go back to our home screen now that we've initiated this. And you won't have to worry much about this. I have a bit ID of six. This is one we use for testing, demonstration, so we have a lot. Let's go back to our home page. Let's say we had to leave on to complete another task. We logged back in. Move to save. Yeah, let's go ahead. I think I already did, but stick it safe. Okay, back to our home screen. We've saved it. We've entered in our project site address and our contact information. How do we locate our in process application? We repeat the same steps we did to begin it. Grants management state. Bit event search, same search. We're going to scroll down the list to locate the grant opportunity. We're going to click the bit event ID. So here we look the same, right? Bit event, bit on event. We could click it, it would start another application. But if we scroll down, it's going to show you my bid. So this is where the application that we saved is sitting. Yours would not say six, most likely. Um, for this one, we have a few going. So I'm just gonna click the link. It may say one in process. And here we have a list of all six of the applications. And then if, I wanna point out one thing while we're here, and I, I'll try to remember to mention this again. The SFS system does not send you a confirmation email after you submit your application. So how's one way you can know that you submitted it? If you notice here in bid event or bid ID one, I have a bid status of posted. If your bid status says posted, that means you submitted your grant application. You notice these others, the other five say saved. And that's what it means. I went in, I saved it. I can come back and work on it. The one that we just saved is number six here. You see it is not posted. We've not submitted it. And we can view and edit it. So if you return into a grant application, Again, most likely yours would be up here, but look for the bit of NID or the bit of uh, number, view and edit. This brings me right back to my application. So after you save it, the process to find your in-process application is to repeat the steps. The difference is you click on the in-process and then view and edit. So you see, we saved our information. Here's our site project address, our uh, contact information. Now, what I would recommend next, and I think this is in all the videos and probably the handbook as well, or the manual, is scroll down here to the very bottom of the page. You're gonna see this events, comments, and attachments. So any attachments that DC has provided or templates that you may need to upload as part of your proposal, you're gonna click this link and they're all gonna be here for you. This list probably doesn't look exactly like the one you're gonna see in Establishing Large Forest. This is for the uh, Regenerate New York, 
but the process is the same. If I need, let's just use the work plan worksheet. If I wanted to view that, and this is a sample work plan, I click the view button, and I'm going to have the option to open it here. Same for all the other attachments. Um, I won't get into much of the attachments here again because they probably don't match exactly what you're going to see uh, for establishing Lawrence Forest. But again, bottom of the page, events, comments, and attachments. View to open the document. If it needs to be completed, upload it to a question. You'll save it to your computer, complete the process of filling out the document, and then upload it. We'll show you how to upload it very shortly here. So again, first two steps, site project address, contact information, save. So that's gonna keep this in process. You can come back to it. Next, view your comments and attachments. Any attachment you need to complete the process will be in this section. So let's look at a few questions and this is a condensed list, but we have good examples of each one. Um, without reading the questions, you'll see this response requires a narrative. Narrative response, and here is my response box here. These are limited, and there's different, let's see, there's two formats here, yes. So in this format, because we don't see add additional comments or attachments, these response boxes are limited to 2,000 characters, so something to be aware of, condense where possible. If it is a... I believe this is yes, no. Yeah. So this is a yes, no type. And I know there are some in the establishing large forest. Pretty simple here. You click the drop down box, select yes or no. So we have a narrative response. We have a yes, no response. And here we get into a little a few more options here. So you notice I have a response box here, but I also had have access to the add comments or attachments. So maybe it's a question that needs both. You need a, a description or text, and you also need an attachment. So let's just, again, we'll type in a short test response here. I want to take a look at uploading documents, so add comments or attachments. If you run out of space or you need to upload an attachment and you see this link, you do have that option. We have another narrative box here that holds up to 2,000 characters. This is not required. This is optional. And we also have a place to upload documents. Pretty simple here. So we have an upload button. We're going to choose a file. Let's go to say tests. It's a test PDF. Um, it is important that these documents be PDFs. I know, I think Michelle and Ian both mentioned this, but PDFs are the preferred format in SFS. The system will allow you to upload other documents, but I know this was mentioned, the system may not pull that into the PDF. Would be accessible, but that would make things harder on the reviewer. So please be aware, non-fillable PDFs is the format you should be uploading documents. So we have our file name here. I'm going to click upload. Now we have our uh, file name and the option to view. Just like Grants Gateway, I recommend each time you upload a document, click that view button and just make sure you, you grab the right document. Um, you don't want it to be something that's not related to your proposal and then maybe your points um, don't add up to what you thought they would be because you uploaded the incorrect document. So verify that you have uploaded the document Verify that it is a PDF. Now, there is a new option here in SFS that, you know, we prefer if you have multiple uploads, maybe multiple maps or pictures, whatever it may be, that you combine those into one PDF. If that's not possible, there is an option here to upload more than one document. So we have our first attachment here. We can view it. If we would like to add a second attachment. We click add new attachments. We see the same options here. Upload. Choose a file, grab our PDF, upload. There we go. I don't believe the attachment description is required, but it would definitely help. Um, as your reviewers are looking at it, it will give them a description of what they're opening. Um, so you can enter in the attachment description if you would like. 
Again, view the document, just verify that you've chosen the right one that you intended to upload and that it is saved in the PDF format. We could keep going, you know, if you wanted to add more, click add new attachments, you'll get another row here. You could add that additional PDF. So we're gonna click okay here. What's our next one? So same thing here, you know, we have our tests or our text response, winter and test. We do have the option again to add a comment or attachment. We've already demonstrated that, so I won't go through that process again. Let's do this one, and then I want to talk a little bit about the next one. Oops. Again, same process. Response required for text. Additional comments or attachments can be added here if needed. Now, you notice this one's a little different, number nine here. This is a required attachment because you notice there is no text response available here. We have the link to enter file attachment response. So we know based on our red star here, and that this is the only option we have. This is a required attachment. The system would prevent you from submitting if it's not attached. But beyond that, same process. We click enter file attachment. See, everything looks the same. Upload. Choose our file. Grab our non-fillable PDF. Upload. Here we go. The test word. Uh, we can view it to make sure we've uploaded the right document. If we would like to add comments, we can add those here. Okay, so that is the technical eligibility questions. That's what they're going to look like. Now let's get into the budget and work plan because again, this is something we see at the help desk all day long. If you notice, nothing really jumps out at this on this screen. It says, "Oh, click here to enter in your budget and work plan." On Grants Gateway, we had a section called Work Plan Properties. We had one called Budget, Expenditure Budget. You clicked on it. In SFS, it's here in the period details. So you're gonna, again, at the bottom of the screen, just above the events, comments, and attachment, we have period details. And that's where your budget and your work plan live, and that's where you're gonna need to be to enter this information. So let's take a quick look at the budget. And one thing I'll point out right away, in case you notice on the screen here, um, Regenerate New Work did have a, bud, a match requirement. Um, establishing the large force does not. So disregard anything you see on this page about match. I will have to complete some match so we can submit this, but don't worry, it is not required for establishing large forest. So again, here on our budget page, you see that our default view in this opening grid here at the top of the screen only shows us five. So again, just a question we get a lot. I want to enter in in other, but it's not showing on my screen. If this was you no know, really expanded, this may not even be showing on your screen. So again, that's where you got to be aware of your scroll bars. We can see it here. But I prefer, as soon as I get to this page, click view all. That way we can see the whole grid here. Now, again, just to point out differences here in the Grants Gateway, if that's something you were used to submit or working in, this top grid or the top budget categories you see here is only to show you what's available. And we can tell in this grant, it's going to be slightly different for establishing large forest, I believe, but for the one we're looking at, Available in the grant, we see all these boxes checked. These are not checked. So this row will tell you what categories you can enter in funding amounts in. Top five for this one, bottom five, I cannot enter in anything in. I also cannot enter in any funding request in this top grid whatsoever. I can only identify what's available. If we scroll down. Brad, just while you're on this page, can I say something quick? Yes. Um, the other category will be used for your fencing and also for your trees. Um, and travel will not be um, highlighted. You won't be able to get into there, but you will other means supplies. So that's what you'll use that category for. And then, uh, you know, salary and fringe is obvious and contractual will be for your forester and any, any other company who's coming in to work on the property that's going to send you an invoice. And equipment, your rental equipment will go under equipment. Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, so if you notice there again, as I scroll down, I'm presented with only five of 10. Again, I prefer as soon as I get to this section, click view all. Now I got all 10 categories here visible on my screen. Now, another thing you probably know, Austin, is that, well, you said six through 10 aren't available in this grant, and there they are. They're listed in this uh, bottom grid. If you notice, for other, I know other is available in uh, establishing large forests, but it, it's not in the, the presentation we're doing here. If I scroll over to this category details, which is where I need to be to entering funding amounts, I can't click it. It's there. I can click. Nothing's opening. But if I go back up here, Okay, what is available? Salary, friends, contractual, travel, equipment. All right, so we go down here. Let's look at equipment. Now, if I click this link here, it opens up a page to enter in information. So this is similar to the Grants Gateway. You remember there was the summary page. You could not enter in dollar amounts, narratives, comments. Same here. I can't come to this page and start entering my salary. I can't come here and start entering equipment funding. I have to click this category details, which is one that we've seen missing on people's screens because their font size is too big or they're not scrolling to the right. But this is your, your next step category details. And again, here's the scroll bars. They're all over the place in SFS. So something to be aware of. You do have the scroll bar here. So I'm just going to enter in some very basic information. We're going to enter in the grant funds that we're requesting for the project. You will not need to enter in match funds for establishing large forest, but we'll need to here. We'll disregard that. And for equipment, that's all the information I need to enter in. We do have a narrative. It is not required by the system, but it's something that is useful. So if you have a narrative to go along to support your request for the funding, that can be entered in on this page. Now, just like we've talked about in the project site addresses there, how do we add multiple lines to our budget? Again, we have our plus sign, but again, something to be aware of. Like I said, I can enter in test. I can enter in my grant funds here. I can enter in my narrative and save it. Where do I enter in the next line? If I have more than one request here, hit my plus button. It will open the second line and you see our Drop down option stop start to build here. We have the view all, but we're already seeing everything we need to see here. We'll do test still. Brad, can I mention something? Yes. The, in that narrative box, that's where you can put how you arrived at the at the amount. So if line one is your fencing, um, you can tell us how you arrived at that amount amount uh, five acres five linear acres whatever the the, the footage is um eight foot high a quote from so and so fencing is da and just explain it there that'll help you with extra cost effectiveness points as well um and then you can also put the that what you write here you can also put that under cost effectiveness in your work plan but th this is a good little box this is a very helpful box for us uh, for reviewers. Okay, so I'm going to click OK. Now you see in the equipment category, I have my funding request. Again, match calculated, you don't need to worry about. And my total. The process is the same for all of these. So if we went to friends, for example, click our category details link. We have our fields to enter in our information. Plus sign to add more lines and narrative box to add narrative or justification. So that is the budget in SFS. Here's our save button. Let's go ahead and do that. Just like Grants Gateway, this is a good spot to mention this. You will be timed out of SFS, so you need to save often. You don't want to lose any information. You know, if you're using the Word document um, that was recommended earlier, you have that backup. That's another reason we recommend doing that outside of the system. And one thing, I'll try not to get off topic here, but I thought of this, I think when Michelle was mentioning the Word document, and we do highly recommend that. Enter in your narratives. You don't have to type in these little small boxes all over SFS. But please don't, another mistake we see is people think, well, I have everything in my Word document. I'm gonna go into SFS the day the bid is due, 
grant application is due, and I'm just going to copy and paste it. If you haven't verified that you have access to the system, you don't have the roles, maybe you don't even know who the primary contact is, you're going to be in trouble on that day. So even if you're using that Word document to um, build your responses, which is highly encouraged, please start those other processes too. Make sure you can get logged in. Make sure you have the correct roles. Make sure you're pre-qualified. Um, so don't think, oh, I've got it all in a Word document. I'm going to take care of everything else the day of the green application. Please don't do that. Start the other processes. Get logged in. Make sure you have access. Make sure you can initiate and submit. And then when you copy and paste your information into the system, you're ready to go. So don't, don't hold up on the other piece just because you're copying and pasting or entering everything into the Word document. Okay, back to where we were going. So let's take a look at the work plan. This is our last piece here. Just to show you how we got here again, return to bid response. Period details at the very bottom of the screen. We have our budget and our work plan. We've already completed our budget. Let's take a look at our work plan. And if you'll notice, you have to click that twice. It's a little defect. They haven't fixed yet. So if you click it once, it doesn't open, just click it again. So we have our project summary, just like we had in the Grants Gateway. This is a very broad, it holds a lot of characters. You can put in a lot of information here where you summarize your entire project. Then we scroll down to our work plan grid here. Just like we had in Grants Gateway, you see we're presented with one blank objective. It's because SFS wants you to enter in all the, inf or not SFS, I'm sorry, the DC would like you to enter in your work plan and they're giving you free reign here. So how do we do that? Just like in Grants Gateway, we need one, at least, I would recommend more, but to meet the system requirement, you will need to complete at least one objective, one task, and one performance measure. For each objective you create, you will need to enter in at least one task for that objective. And for each task you create, you will need to submit at least one performance measure. That's the system requirements. So let's enter in one objective here. We're gonna to need to enter in a name, and then we're gonna to need to enter in a description. So let's go ahead and save this. We don't have to save it at this point, but I wanna show you what's gonna happen here. So right away, I get an error message. Please see messages at the top of the page. I scroll up, what's it telling me? At least one task is needed. We knew that. So we can scroll back down. How do we add our next task? You'll see these add buttons, add objective, add task, add performance measure. So if we wanna add a task to our objective, which we're gonna to need to to submit, we click our link, we add our task. That error message is related to our missing, missing task. And we're gonna save. Again, I could go ahead and do the performance measure, but just to show you the error messages and what you're gonna see, we save. We got another error message, right? What's this one going to be? At least one performance measure is needed. Okay, perfect. We knew that. Let's add our performance measure using our add buttons here. And we're going to do, this is another common thing we see here at the help desk. We're going to enter in our uh, this name. We're going to enter in our description. That's all we see here on the screen, right? We're going to click save. We have another message. Performance measure response type is required. It's in red, it's telling us that. But when we look at our grid here, even if we scroll to the right, there's no place to choose that option. What you need to do is click this more details button. It's very important. And then you see we have the option to select our performance measure type. If you're on the basic info, you don't see that. You're never gonna clear the error message. Click more details. You can select our perform or our performance measure response type. We'll do a text. We're going to enter in a text response. And then yeah, all, all of ours should be text comment. Okay. Um, I don't think it comes up as a default though. But we don't want to see any attachments here or numbers or anything like that. We want the narrative. Select a text and comment for performance measure type. Again, you're going to need to click the more details button to access that. 
So let's go back now to our basic info. What if we wanted to add a, another performance measure under this objective? As long as we have this box checked next to objective, add performance measure. Oh, I'm sorry, I need to be checked next to the performance measure. There we go. We have one of two. We had one of one. Now we have one or two. You can have two performance measures or more under each task. All right, well, let's say we decided we do not want this one. We check the box next to the performance measure we're trying to delete. Check our, our click our delete box. Do you wish to remove this entry? Yes. There we go. It's gone. Let's say, let's add another objective here. So we're going to add an objective. To select objective to add another one. There we go. We have objective two. Go ahead and enter in some information here. Save. Actually, no, let's just go ahead and add our tasks. Start this reorder test. Two. Two. Running out of time. Okay, we're going to add our performance measure. So now we know we need to add our response type based on the error message we got earlier. How do we do that? Click our more details button here. We're going to select text comment. Enter in our text. Save. Save often. You don't want to lose your work. Okay, so we got a couple of objectives here, a couple of performance measures. What if for some reason you wanted to reorder these? So if we check objective one or objective two, actually, move item up, use sync what's up. Let's go back to basic info. You can see now we've moved what we originally had as objective two up to objective one. That's something you need to do. You can very easily do that with these buttons. We want to move it back down. There we go. Test two. And you see it moved all the Everything associated with objective two went all at the same time. So objective task performance measure, you can move them up and down all three together. Um, so we have our ads, our reorder if needed, delete if we need to. And the key thing with most of this, if we're going to add, let's say, a performance measure here, make sure the box is checked next to the performance measure you want to add to or the task, or if you want to add a third objective. Click the objective box, add objective. Now, if we want to delete that, we have it checked next to row seven. We delete, yes. There we go. And there's our there's our work plan. Uh, okay, save. Back. Now, one thing I want to point out, and this is again quite a bit different. We're almost done here. Budget properties. I need to know what my budget total is here on this page, and I'm going to show you why. So if we scroll down, mine was pretty simple. We have grant funds requested, $200, match funds, 20 Again, you don't need match funds. So back on our main screen here, return to bid response. You will need to enter in the amount of funding requested in your unit bid price here. You try to submit without this, you're going to get an error message. It won't let you continue. Now, I am actually not sure if I need to include the match. So we're going to try it without. So uh, th again, this is your total requested amount. So whatever that total budget number is, it's not by category. It's whatever your total budget is. You will need to enter in in this field here to submit. So let's save. So yeah, it didn't require me to do match. So that's good. It'll match exactly what you're doing. Um, enter in your unit bid price. Again, that's the grant funds you're requesting, the total, not by category, your total budget. So back up near the top here, we had our site project address, bidder contact information, which is required to save your application. You can't save it until that has been entered. We have our different response types. 
We're going to scroll to the bottom to access any attachments that DEC has provided. In the events, comments and attachments section, we have our period details. Which is where we're going to enter in our budget and work plan. So we're ready to submit. Let's go ahead and click the submit bid. Are you done making changes and would you like to post this bid? Responses may not be edited after posting. And that is true. Once you submit this, you can't make any changes to it. So make sure you're done. Go ahead and submit. But once it's submitted, you can't make any edits. We're going to say yes. There we go. We have your bid has been successfully submitted. That is your confirmation. Um, that and what we showed earlier. Now, I'm going to go ahead and click OK. You see, this takes me right back out to the search. And I wanted to quickly show you one thing here because we get this question a lot and it's a valid question. You submitted your application and you would like a copy of it. We go back to our home screen and this is the same as returning to your in process application. Grants management state. Bid event search. Again, we don't have to enter in any, inform any information in the search fields. We can scroll right down. We're going to click our bid event ID to access our in process application or an application we've submitted. Now, when we scroll down, we have our in process and submitted six in process. And we know we were working on six. And we see that our status is posted. That's again our confirmation that we did submit this for review. We click this view button here. Yep, no more changes allowed, which we knew that. The bid response PDF right here. This is going to be a PDF version of everything you submitted as part of your application, assuming they are PDF attachments. Uh, so if you want to copy, click the link. And this is where I'll talk about quickly because we're really running out of time now is be aware of the pop up blockers. If you're trying to open up a PDF in SFS, you see, I click the bid response PDF. My pop up blocker is on. But I can still access it, so you'll click the link. Open up the PDF, and you'll have everything just like we had in Grants Gateway. You know, all your narrative responses, attachments, budget, work plan will all be here. So, if you would like a copy of it, um, that's where it lives. So, um, I know people probably do have some questions, and I know some questions have been answered along the way. Um, but that is the end of my presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Concerning SFS. I don't think there's anything new. Okay, well, if there's no questions about SFS, I, I know there's probably lots of questions about the program, so I will get out of the way. But again, please start early. And if you have any questions, please email the help desk, SFS uh, help desk at ny.gov. Brett, thank you so much. You're welcome. Every, every time I do a tutorial, I really learn a lot more about SFS. It, it really is not, not as bad as you think. Um, it, just follow those basic directions and everybody will be fine. But don't hesitate to contact the help desk or contact us. Um, it, it seems like you're calling you know, Time Warner Cable or the phone company and you're not speaking to anybody who knows what they're talking about or doesn't care about you. <laughs> but that's not the case. So don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, we want to give you good service. So if there's no more questions, I think we can close. Ian, are you still there? Oh, yeah, I'm still here. Okay. Um, did you want to address any of these other questions? Well, we, Molly, don't, we don't know whether the, per the people are still on, do we? We don't know if they're still on. Molly, did you have any grouped ones you want me to respond to? Um, I was gonna say, a maybe, lot of them were very individual based that were okay. left over. So, yeah, maybe we'll just uh, collate those uh, once we get done with this presentation and we'll be reaching out to people um, kind of on a one off basis based on your questions. And we can add it to the Q&A that's on SFS where Brad showed everybody how to get to that. Yep. And the Q&A will also be posted on the web page as well.
Yes, and this webinar will be also posted so people sure. can refer back to it. Yep, I'm going to be out of town for a couple of days, but I will try to have it posted to the web page by next, the end of next week. Wonderful. Very thank good. You. Well, thank you so much, everybody. Those that stayed the distance, it'll be well worth your while. Yep. Thanks, thank Molly. Thanks, for Ian. Appreciate it all. And thank again, you, Brad. Thank you, guys. And again, with any questions that are individual, please just send it to the large forests at dec.ny.gov or the help desk if you have SFS questions. Um, Mark, did you want to chime in real quick? 